Welcome to the Three Forms Podcast, a joint production of Beaver Dam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. Together we are touring our historic three forms of unity, the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. Considering how these old and trusted paths can equip and lead God's people in the midst of today's challenges. So let's start this week's episode. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Pastor Lloyd Hemstreet. And I am Reverend Tyler Wagamaker. And we are at episode seven, Lord's Day seven of the Heidelberg Catechism. Tyler? Yes, we get to keep talking about Jesus because we were introduced to our Lord Jesus Christ in the last Lord's Day, Lord's Day six. And so we're going to hear a little bit more about salvation through Jesus Christ. Yeah, we get to keep talking about all the good stuff. We do. Everything that Christ has done for us. And, and faith. We get to talk about matters of faith today, that, which is really important about the Apostles' Creed. We get to hear about that, yeah. talk about that. So there's there's a lot of meatiness here in Lord's Day Son. Right, right. And and uh, you'll notice the, the Apostles' Creed, that is one of the uh, historic markers, kind of one of the common things that you'll find. Uh, the Heidelberg isn't the only catechism that was ever written. By what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> there are there are multiple catechisms out there, and uh, there are things that most of these catechisms of that day and age that they would cover. Uh, one of those were the Apostles' Creed. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing is the Ten Commandments, mm-hmm. and and so these are kind of the markers that you see broadly in in all of the catechisms yeah. of the day. The, the I believe the Lord's issues. Prayer also, too, Lord's Prayer, is, that's it. Yep. Is, uh, is a key yep. one. A third, so third that is, as Those are commonalities across the board through many of these catechisms written around the time of the Reformation. So. Right, right. And so, and so, Lord's Day 7, hey, here we go. We're, we're showing our, our unity with these broader catechisms, as well as, you know, the Heidelberg's going to define it things in, in ways that would be a little different than some of the catechisms. We're the very nature. ecumenical, though, there, Lloyd. Very there ecumenical. There we yes. go. Yes. We're, we're very Catholic. We'll get to that maybe, too. That um, we will. Yes. That, that we will. Although last time episodes. we established you are not Roman Catholic. You would not make a good Roman Catholic. No, no, no. I wasn't I wasn't praying to the saints well. That's so right. That's right. There's no storehouse of... of of merits no. to be gotten. So yeah. All right. Well, we do have four questions to make it through today. So let's dive into question twenty, the first question of Lord's Day Seven. Uh, question twenty: Are all men saved through Christ, just as all were lost through Adam? And the answer is no. Only those are saved who, by true faith, are grafted into Christ and accept all His blessings. Hmm. All right, Tyler. That is not a very universalistic kind of uh, message where Jesus is going to save everyone. There's as if there's no such thing as hell even too, even though hell's not mentioned here. But salvation of some means that there are also be those who will not be saved. And it's not just the worst of the worst like the Hitlers and the Stalins of the world either. Right. Right. This is a uh kind of an exclusivist uh hmm. little bit of a a catechism question. Uh, you know, we we we've going through sin and and recognizing uh, how that played out. We've seen how all have been guilty of sin. How all were uh, products of the fall. Um, you know, Romans five twelve talks about therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The reality of of death and that uh, its presence in this world is a testimony to the universal nature of sin and the universal condemnation that that all human beings rest under. And the good news of the gospel, the good news that we're getting into, is the fact of salvation. Uh, but the reality is that Scripture outlines is not everybody is going to be saved. No. Not everybody is going to be on the same on the correct, on the right path. And uh, God's Word kind of says there is a right path that you got to be on. Well, not only are not all dogs going to heaven, but not all human beings are going to heaven either. Um, Contra that one. Where was that movie a number of years ago? Wasn't there All Dogs Go to Heaven? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of when I was a kid. An animated one that's many, many years ago. So the Lord's Day 7 is very countercultural in many ways. 
already we're getting to that in, in a profound way. We're getting to that right away in question and answer 20, where we're drawing a distinction that there are those who are saved and those who are not saved. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's very countercultural in many ways because we, are the, we have a very inclusivistic kind of culture which wants to say that everyone, everyone gets there. And <clears throat> almost the presumption that everyone will be saved. Right. And the catechism is very clear. Only those are saved who by true faith are grafted. And then I know the next question and answer is going to get into true faith. Right. Why that? Describe why what so that important. is. Yeah. But it does talk about this being grafted into Christ. It even gets me thinking, Lloyd, about Romans, uh, Romans 11, where it talks about this, these engrafted branches. Even though it's kind of a segue a little bit uh, in terms of who belongs to, who are the people of God, that this is, that this is one tree that's, that's growing here, that has grown throughout all of human history, God's people, this branch. And so there are not two trees, kind of contra the dispensationalists who almost have, you know, like the Israel Jewish tree, and then you have the, the church Gentile-ish kind of a tree. There's only one tree. God has only ever had one people, and those one people have always been saved through true faith. There have not been God's people in the Old Covenant were saved in a in almost a works righteousness, kind of a, a sacrificial system sort of keeping of the law away, and then God's New, Te- New Covenant, New Testament people are saved in a different way. Romans 11 very clearly and wonderfully brings out that that there is a grafting into Christ. We've, if you're going to be saved, you're always being grafted ultimately into Jesus Christ, and it's only ever this one grafting of true faith. True faith is always what saved God's people, Old Covenant and New Covenant alike. Right. There, there's no other, no other means of, of salvation, and, and yeah, there, there's only those. If in the Old Testament people were truly saved by their works— then Jesus' prayer in the garden, if there is any other way, you know, remove this cup from me, would be answered. Right. Because there would be salvation by, well, just obedience. Then God's people can go back to being obedient, yeah. and, and Jesus doesn't have to die in the place of, of sinners. And no, that is clearly not what God's Word says. And so, once again, we have this, this exclusive, either we're grafted in or we're not. Um, I think of... Jesus at the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, kind of one of his his closing arguments that he leaves is in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, with this warning that he gives there, uh, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that mm. leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so there, Jesus lays out this expectation that, no, not all are going to be saved. That's not going to be the majority position, even from, right. from what he say, says and what he lays out there. And also this expectation that, you know, Christianity isn't going to just all be <coughs> sunshine and lollipops, as they say. Mm. The, the way is going to be hard, and the gate is narrow, and we're going to have to strive to enter it as we follow after him. And just so long, expectation. Just as long as it's not root beer lollipops. I'm not as big of a fan of the root beer lollipops, Lloyd. Um, oh. the, the dum-dum ones, okay. the dum-dum sucker ones. Okay, so... Lollipops, so, root beer. Yeah, so like grape or, or... Grape is really good. Okay, okay. If we're talking about grape ones. lollipops, now you have me, for sure. <laughs> okay. Yes. And butterscotch. I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of the butterscotch. Butterscotch ones too. I'm not sure. Right. Well, I'm not sure where Reformed Calvinists are. Maybe we're the Reformed butter. Or maybe we're the butterscotch lollipops. Perhaps right. is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jesus, a little bit sweet, a little bit hard. salty. Kind of a, a mixture of that. Yeah. We have a saltiness and we have a sweetness. That there, just the perfect, this perfect balance. Yes, that's biblical. We're the butterscotch. Lollipops. Dum dum lollipops of the uh, world. Yeah, I, I've I've heard many people refer to you as the dum dum. But anyways, <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> moving on to question twenty one. <laughs> what what is true faith? Uh, the, and the answer, and this is one of the most beautiful, uh, one of my favorite questions and answers. Uh, question twenty one. What is true faith? The answer is, true faith is not only a knowledge and conviction that everything God reveals in His Word is true. 
It is also a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us by Christ, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, have been made forever right with God, and have been granted salvation. Tyler, there is so much going on here, so much beauty uh, in <laughs> yeah. this description of the Christian Christian life and what it means to be a follower of Christ here. I, where do we start? I uh, mean, <laughs> you know, memorizing memorizing the catechism overall is good, but if someone has had to pick and choose certain question answers for sure to memorize, question answer twenty one would be one of those. Just a key treasure in, in terms of personal personal faith issues, but also a, a sort of communalness too. So let's dive into question answer 21. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, looking at it, there's, I would say there's there's three things that it, it highlights here that, that uh, our true faith is made up of three different parts, three different pieces mm-hmm. that we could break it down into. Uh, there's the knowledge, there's the conviction, and then there's the assurance. And the expectation of true faith is that it will contain all three of these pieces. You can't have a true faith that, that matches up if it's lacking one of these. If one of these is not in any way present, well, then you missed it. You missed the mark. You don't have that true faith, that saving faith, that uh, faith that, that those who are redeemed have and hold. Knowledge, the knowledge that everything... God reveals in his word is true. We have to know God's word. First of all, that the the gospel, we have to have an understanding of it. That goes to uh, the importance of studying the Bible, sitting under the preaching of the word, of parents having times of devotions with their children, maybe at nighttime and nighttime prayers, to to instill a, a knowledge Christian education, whether it's homeschooling, Christian day schools. I know in the Dutch Reformed side of things, Christian Reformed Church, we've been very supportive, for instance, of Christian day schools and of Christian education, because the knowledge component is an important component of in, in the development of faith, is to know God's Word. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, one of the passages that comes to my mind in, in regards to, to this key of knowledge uh, in Jesus' high priestly prayer from John 17. Uh, you know, uh, John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. And it is what Jesus is praying for his people to be sanctified by. And so, how are we going to do that if we do not have a, a knowledge and, and an understanding of, of his word and a recognition that it's not just like any of the other books of the Bible, or, or I mean, any of the other books in the world, uh, it's not just the writings of, of men. It is separate, and it's set apart, and it is uh, unique, and it's uniquely effective in, in working God, by God's Spirit in our lives. Well, and that's why the evil one so often has gone after the authority of Scripture. That's one of the battles that the Church has fought in different ways over the centuries. It goes back to the authority of Scripture, the authority of God's Word. So if we are to have a, eventually even this conviction about it, too, that everything God reveals in His Word is true, we have to know it, and we have to have that conviction, we have to have that knowledge, because that is rooted to faith, mm-hmm. is... Um, and we're called to have faith in many different ways in life. Sometimes one of the attack is, well, how can you believe the Bible? It's this old book written, you know, thousands of years ago by people who had a, an agenda. Um, thankfully, there are a lot of good rebuttals to that, some good apologetic works out there that kind of answers that. But those who oftentimes will lodge that complaint against Scripture will not live that consistently out so often in their lives. There are many things that they, for instance, have not seen with their eyes, but they believe. Um, you know, I think about, for instance, I was been tra- I mean, I like to travel, and when I was out in California, I used to live in California for a couple of years, but I would go to Sequoia National Park. The, these giant sequoia trees, Im- Im- immense, enormous trees. That if I would tell you, you know, such trees that that you can drive cars through are are out there. It might be like, oh, this is kind of a J.R. Tolkien sort of fantasy world. 
with the ants or so, you know, trees that walk around practically. But no, there are, there are actually giant trees out there that tower that you can drive vehicles through that are that are you know hundreds and hundreds over a thousand years old these giant trees and lots of people have seen them and they've even taken pictures or they've written about it but if but if I've never actually been there or I should say if someone else has never actually been there they're having to believe the testimony of lots of people is that it's there and they believe it some of these same critics of the Bible say why well, wasn't there you know this is all made up but they believe the testimony of history and of people who've been places that are seemingly fantastical, and they believe it, even though they haven't seen it. Because on some level, there is a type of a faith that they have. Well, God's word is wonderfully rich and true in so many profound ways. It is, I don't want to say it's easy, and yet on some level, it's easy. It's one of the easiest things to believe in terms of, of evidences, in terms of how it all fits together in terms of how it personally then also convicts. There is a, a wonderfulness to God's word that it's that I would say in many ways it's easy to believe by God's grace that that this is true. Right, right. And that and that's the starting point. We if we're gonna have true faith, it's going to come with that knowledge of God's word. And it ties right in with that second point, like you were talking mm-hmm. about that conviction. Um a, a conviction is is how we respond to things hmm. that we believe, and we can have knowledge of of lots of different things in the world and not be called to really have a conviction of them. Uh, you know, I haven't driven through a sequoia tree. I haven't seen those myself, and so I have a a knowledge of them. Um, but for me to go ahead and take that to a, a conviction and to to live it out, that would be an, another step of it, of taking that knowledge and saying it is separate from a fairy tale land, from a a, a mythical uh, land written in some novel. That that this is something that is true, and I'm going to live in such a way that displays that. That I'm going to to go ahead and and live out that conviction of that truth that I believe. Uh, we're all living each and every day in line with the convictions that we hold. And uh, sometimes those can uh, portray the areas that of our weakness, too. Hmm. And so, yeah, this knowledge and conviction, they must go together. And that's what the Catechism says. In true faith, you are going to have both this knowledge of God's Word. It's going to be something you hear and understand and, and grasp to varying degrees and grow therein, but there's also going to be a conviction that makes you live out what it is you're hearing and live in accordance to what it is you that you that you believe. It's not a fantasy world. It's very real. It's very true. It's very true, yeah. and it's going to impact the decisions that you make. If, it, if we did have a fantasy world, just curious, Lloyd, what character would you be in a fantasy world? Like, what kind of weapon or skill would you have? Um, you ever thought about that? I, it depends on what world fantasy world it is, I guess. I always liked in the, the Tolkien one, Legolas, how he was amazing with his with his skill using the bow and arrow. And and it was like a plentiful amount of bows. Like he never ran out of, of or arrows. arrows. Yes. He, he just never ran out of the arrows. Yes. It was and his his aim was amazing. Right. I right. always thought it would be great if I was in a fantasy world to be able to have skills like that, like yeah. Legolas. Yeah. Those would be so, those would be good skills to have. I would take that. You would take that? I, I, take I already those. took it. You gotta have your own. Oh, so you gotta come up with your own Lloyd. So. Now now I'm Gimli and I have to get thrown over the, the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, someone has to be a Gimli, too. So, <laughs> that's right. All right. Uh, the third part of true faith, though, is this reality of assurance. That that it, true faith that is active in our lives, not only going to be God's Word, not only going to be a conviction that, li- that we live it out, but it's going to come along with it, this piece of assurance. Uh, yeah, what is assurance, Tyler? What is that d- dis- display in our lives? How does that work? Well— the assurance itself plays itself out in terms of, I mean, we have a, a peacefulness right. that no matter what happens politically 
I mean, we're in the middle of a political season again here. It seems like we're always in the middle of political political season right, right. <laughs> in the United States here. And no matter what, how things play itself out politically, it's not going to be the end of the world uh, because Christ is still on the throne. I belong to Jesus Christ. I have a right relationship with, with God because of Jesus Christ. And when I have that, the God of the universe— that even when this life passes, the life that is to come, God's in control of that. And so there is there's a tremendous amount of peace, for right. instance. Even if it is the end of the world, I still have peace. It doesn't matter exactly. whether it is or it isn't. Exactly. Either way, I'm I'm secure in Christ. It is. And and yeah. And it gives true. you a boldness in life too when you have that. Oh, absolutely. Because then you can almost live without abandon. Uh you can throw yourself into the cause of Christ and to his church. And as the saints of old, many of them did, facing persecution, the martyrs of old, they were willing to be persecuted and to suffer tremendous loss because they knew that this world was not the be-all and end-all, and they had a right relationship with God, and they knew what was going to happen beyond this life. Right, right. That assurance built, uh, that assurance breeds peace, it breeds a confidence, and it, it, it displays our security in Jesus Christ. That is what that true faith will display in our, our lives. And, and that's, that's how the catechism summarizes what is true faith, and, and that is how we see it played out, how God's Word speaks of it, and how we see it play out in yes. our lives. Yes. In our lives. All right, we got two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, question 22, what then must a Christian believe? And the answer is, everything God promises us in the gospel— that gospel is summarized for us in the articles of our Christian faith, a creed beyond doubt, and confessed throughout the world. Hmm. All right. Uh, so what is it that a Christian must believe? What is it that they must know? How, how detailed and uh, precise does their theology have to be to be a, a true faith, to, to, to be a saving faith? Uh, do they have to be able to have a complete map of the end times on uh, one of their bedroom walls and, <laughs> and lay out all the things of, 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 of the Antichrist of the day and where they're going to be? Is that what's required, Tyler? <laughs> it, well, according to the Catechism, no, yeah, that, right. that is not. Uh, although such, such graphs and timelines would be maybe fascinating, maybe give you disturbing dreams at night if it's in your bedroom, <laughs> all the places to, have it maybe on your ceiling. Just lay awake at night and look at all these multi-headed monsters and dragons, perhaps, <laughs> uh, and, and revelation that are going to come about. So, yeah. I, but at the same time, too, it's it's something that is easily understandable. There are some basics. It's not a free for all. Mm -hmm. There are things that we do believe that differentiates us, for instance, from a Muslim. Uh, a Muslim cannot confess the words of the Apostles' Creed, which we'll get to as we, in the upcoming Lord's Days, as it kind of unpacks it, for instance. Um, so there are standards. Right. Christian faith does have, sta does right. have standards. There is a, a content. There is there's, there's, a content. It's not just some warm feeling in my heart. Yes. And <laughs> and me repeating, uh, you know, uh, a sinner's prayer, that is not the full uh, understanding of what it means to be a Christian. That is not the, uh, that's not the sum total of what must be believed. Uh, everything God promises us in the gospel, that is what the catechism starts out with, that, that the, the God's promises in his word, the gospel, and then as it's summarized in the creed, this is what, this is the content, the, the, the bare minimum content of, hey, this is what separates mm -hmm. those who do not have a true faith, do do not have a saving faith, from those that do. They believe and understand and know these things. Uh, not completely as a college professor might be able to articulate them uh, when they're six years old. Uh, there's going <laughs> to be an age-appropriate growth, mm -hmm. and there's uh, the gospel ex expectation of growing and maturing in our faith. But there is a baseline. Uh, there are basics that, that you know, a minimum standard that must be met. And the Apostles' Creed is wonderful in laying those out for the Church throughout the ages, and we are the recipients of that, thankfully. One of the things, too, is it was just noticing and 
the previous question and answer, and now this this question and answer, Lloyd, is how the faith, the Christian faith, is a very personal one. It has to be a personal one. I have to have a conviction, for instance. That's a very personal thing and assurance. Uh, but it is also something that is a very communal thing, too. And it brings that out a little bit here, where in question and answer 22, it says this creed is confessed throughout the world, that the church is this global throughout all tribes, nations, that the Lord has been bringing God's people together. And that's the importance of also the church. I mean, we'll eventually get in the next question and answer to the the Apostles' Creed and how it's recited. I I'm, know I'm, in Coopersville you recite the Creed, in Beaver Dam here we recite it pretty much every Sunday night. Mm-hmm. We, are, we do that together. There's something powerful about saying the gospel together, saying out loud what it is that we believe, because it is also communal. We are shaped communally through that. This isn't just what I think it ought to be. This is an external force. That's why I said Lord's Day 7 is very countercultural, because Lord's Day 7 is almost the the Disney mantra, the Disney creed, is look inside yourself, and then you'll discover your truth there. But Lord's Day 7 says, where's the truth? The truth is in the gospel. You look outside yourself to these definitive points about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Lord stays eight and beyond. We'll explore that more. But this is really a repudiation of this Disney creed, which has captivated our our culture, which is why a lot of times people say, oh, as long as I believe in God, I don't have to go to church. I can kind of have my own personal little faith. We see that here in West Michigan. Many people who were raised in the church or had some sort of connection, but they don't go to church anymore, but they still believe themselves to be Christians. They, they think they're doing, they're doing their Christianity by themselves. It doesn't work that way. The, the Christian faith is a very personal faith, but it's also a very communal faith, right. and you need both, both. and this right. Lord's Day 7 brings that out. It, it's not enough to just be communal in your Christian Correct. walk, and, you know, I, I go to church, I go to Bible study, and it doesn't, I don't think about it outside of that, and it doesn't impact or affect my life. No, that's not, that's not true faith, that's not a true Christian life, and it's also not well, I believe, and I'm assured of these, and it's my Bible and me, and I read it, and so I'm good to go. No, we read it in community. We hold these things. We make this confession in community, and it is that community together that is displaying, uh, that it displays God's work in this world. And again, back to question and answer 21, it says, I believe, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, may forever right God, been granted salvation. But there's that understanding that there are others, right? And there's me, but I'm part of the others, right? There is this con- being confessed, this creed, this gospel summarization is confessed throughout the world, right? And there's a a powerful beauty in knowing that I'm not alone, and that the church is Christ's church, and it will continue on, right? And that we've been grafted, we've been into grafted into that it. bigger broader body. Yes. It is not just about me, not just about what I believe, not the Disney creed. It is a creed that without without fail. But maybe you should just let it go. <laughs> no. Let it go. No, we, we need to let that go. Tyler. Well, there are cold winter winds outside as we're recording it, this right now. It is practically that kingdom. It, it looks a little like right Elsa was active. Elsa there. has been very, very active, I think. She's been touching many things, but we should uh, right. just let it go. Well, before we get into let that false creed. Were you going to sing, by the way, no, this I'm not. episode? I'm, I'm, I'm about we're, to read we're the creed. Oh, okay. So let's question get to 23, yes. let's do the creed. Um, question 23, what are these articles? The answer is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Amen. Yes, I want <laughs> that, the amen part too. You, you got to add the amen. It's kind of waiting. There waiting. It is. There it is. So that is the that is the creed, and that this is uh, the content that the mm-hmm. catechism is laying out. This is what we, at a minimum, need to be able to believe and confess, and it's what unites us, as you said, with Christians uh, throughout the ages and and around the world. Uh, so many different um, historical faith tradition or parts of the Christian church, and yet, hey, these are things that we, at a minimum, can come together and say, oh, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what we believe. Hmm. Tyler, uh, that's Lord's Day 7. We're, we're, we're out of time. We got to wrap it up, and we'll continue in the coming weeks to explore this creed and, and go into the details of it further. Wonderful. All right. See you then. Thanks for joining us on the Three Forms Podcast, a joint ministry of Beaverdam Christian Reformed Church and Coopersville CRC. To contact us, feel free to reach out through our Facebook page, Substack, on YouTube, or email us directly at threeformspodcast at gmail.com. Three Forms Podcast, walking the good and trusted old paths together. Thank you.